In a past life, I was a psychiatrist. Well, let me rephrase that. Before my life fell to pieces, I was a psychiatrist. And a damn good one, too. It's um, tough to really say what makes a psychiatrist good and what they do, but I started in my field early. Got great experience my first few years in the business, and uh, not before long, I almost had more clients than I could handle. I'm not saying someone would walk into my office suicidal and do a complete 180 in one day, but my clients trusted me and uh, felt that I genuinely helped them. So I came very highly recommended, and my rate was admittedly steep. That being said, I was used to a higher tier of patient. I'm not sure how the Jennings family found me, but I assume they were pointed in my direction from the previous psychiatrist, as that's sometimes the case. Someone walks through your door that you're incapable of helping for whatever reason, so you make some recommendations. One day I got a call from Mrs. Gloria Jennings, a very wealthy real estate owner who wanted me to work with her son, Andrew. Apparently, Andrew had just about worn out every psychiatrist in the state, and I was essentially their last option. Andrew was your typical drug abuser, his poison of choice being heroin. And as anyone in my field could tell you, these people are just a headache to deal with. If they're not clean and scatterbrained, then they're high and not making any sense. I wouldn't have taken him as a patient, but uh, Miss Jennings offered me double my usual rate, so I couldn't say no. It was the worst decision I've ever made. I met Andrew early on a Monday morning. From experience, it's easier to catch these types before they've had the chance to use. Best case scenario, they don't even show up and you get a free hour. But Andrew was 15 minutes early. He certainly looked like a heroin addict. Dark bags under his green eyes, hair disheveled, a scraggly beard growing on his face. He looked to be in his early 20s. He was tall and inexplicably thin and wore baggy, plain clothes that only accentuated his sharp figure. I welcomed him into my office and offered him a seat. He sat down and began rubbing his hands together and exploring my office with his eyes, you know, darting rapidly. For my own privacy, I'll refer to myself as Dr. A. So, Andrew, I begin. I'm Dr. A. Why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? For the first time, he made eye contact. He hesitated for a moment and then spoke. Look, this is about the eighth or ninth time I've started to scratch, so I'm just going to cut to the chase. My mom probably told you I was a drug abuser, and I am. I use heroin and cocaine if I can get my hands on it. I opened my mouth to ask if he had ever used both at the same time to explain the danger of the combination, but he beat me to it. No, I always do them separately. I'm not an idiot, he said. I don't think you're an idiot, I lied. I've seen a lot of users in my day, trust me. Andrew hadn't stopped staring at me. I shifted uncomfortably in my seat and asked the obvious next question. Uh, why do you use? Well, on the nights I don't want to get sleep, I use cocaine. And on the nights I don't want to dream, I use the heroin. As he said this, he dropped his gaze to the floor, still rubbing his hands. I'm, I'm sorry, the nights you don't want to sleep, you use cocaine? I asked, just to make sure that what he said was right. That's correct, doctor, he said, still not looking at the ground. And why don't you want to sleep, Andrew? Because I don't want to see Ublu, he answered shifting his gaze back up at me and registering my reaction to that word. I'm sorry? Who's Ublu? I asked curiously. Andrew sighed. Ublu is a monster I, I see sometimes in my dreams who controls them. And how does this Ublu control your dreams, Andrew? Well, I don't know if his name's actually Ublu or if that's what it's fucking called, but that's all it ever says. And I know he controls them because of the shit that happens in my dreams. When he's there, no one would ever dream of, he said to me. His hands finally unclasped and evolved into 
this on the sides. And this was starting to get interesting. And I decided to go a little bit deeper down into the rabbit hole and ask a nine question. And what sort of things um, have you dreamed of? Look, I'm not crazy. It's not like I go into these huge benders and dream of this fucked up thing. I used to be a star athlete and I was on pace to graduate valedictorian before this thing started fucking with me, okay? He was getting visibly angry. I don't think you're crazy, I lied again. If I did, I'd have given up on you and told you to just go. I'm a psychiatrist, Andrew. I know crazy when I see it. This seemed to calm him down just a little bit. But you, you need to understand that I need to know everything before I can make a diagnosis of how to help you. So I'll ask you again, what sort of things have you dreamed of? I saw him unwind and I knew I had broken through. Terrible things, he said. People and things that I love and, and the worst imaginable things happening to them. He was staring at the floor again. Well, what sort of things, Andrew? Um, one time, he swallowed hard. Uh, one time, I I dreamt that I was stuck in a cage, in a basement that I've I'd never seen before, and there were three men in masks, raping and beating my mother. This startled me, and I flinched a bit. And he noticed I was losing him. Uh, Go on, Andrew, I said comfortingly, masking my shock as intrigue. She was calling out to me and I was crying and every time she would cry out to to me or cry out for help, a man would hit her and no matter how bad she bled, she kept calling out and they kept hitting her and, and violating her. Now, I'll interject here and say that normal people do not dream these things. Dreams like these are rare even among the most severe of psychopaths and now... I was starting to understand how Andrew had gone through so many psychiatrists in just a few years. Either he was a time bomb of the most criminal psychopath in history, or he had a new sleep disorder not yet seen in my field. The pros of diagnosing a new disorder were hugely outweighed by the cons of fostering a kid who would potentially make Ted Bundy look like a purse snatcher. I was shaken up. but. I managed to keep it together. In these situations, it's important not to get lost in the detail and just nail down all your facts. Um, how do you know that Ublu was behind this dream? I asked him. Because at the end of the dream, I always hear him make that horrible noise. Ublu! He mimicked, high-pitched like a sound a small animal would make. And you always hear this noise? That's how he controlled your dream? I always hear him, but sometimes I see him too, but only for a second, and then I wake up. I see. Could you draw Ublu for me, Andrew? I slid him a notepad and a pen. A little confused at first, but probably because I was, uh, to him, believing every word. But he grabbed the pen and paper and began scribbling. I looked down at my watch. 20 minutes have passed, not bad. And then out the window, at the sky, which was a clear shade of blue, I heard the pen hit the table and the notepad slid back to me. I looked down to the pad and choked my leaping heart back down into my chest. The thing had a long, dangling snout, almost like an elephant's trunk with a tongue poking out. Its face was devoid of features aside from two large, upright oval eyes that were completely black. It had six limbs and a long, slender torso. It was hunched down, and the back and middle knees were just a little above its body. It could obviously make itself tall if it needed to be. The feet were circular with six appendages sticking out in all directions, all equidistant from the others. The front two legs were considerably longer, and had just two extremely long fingers on each hand, both at the top of his hand and in the same direction. It was eerie to look at. It had no clearly dangerous features, no claws, no teeth, but 
I still couldn't help but feel a chill on my spine when I examined it. I snapped out of my state and looked back at Andrew, who was staring at me and waiting apprehensively. I think I had my diagnosis. Well, Andrew, I think I know what's going on. He didn't look at all relieved. Oh, he said monotonously. Yes, I think uh, what's going on here is um, that you've been lucid dreaming. Yeah, I thought that too, he interrupted. I sat there shocked. You think that I had some traumatic nightmare of this thing and now whenever I lucid dream I subconsciously insert it into my mind which triggers a traumatic scenario to play out before me. Rarely in my 10 years of practice have I been speechless and I sat there mouth agape. Andrew stared back at me and, and I watched him smirk. I told you Dr. Ray I'm not an idiot. I looked into all these things when it first started happening. That's why I started using it. I learned that opioids can suppress lucid dreaming, and in the beginning they did, but eventually he kept worming his way in, and the more I used, the harder he fought to keep coming back. So I tried the cocaine to keep me awake, but I found that only made things worse. I stayed up too long and I started experiencing micro sleep. I didn't know if I was awake or dreaming, but I mean, I mean, he must have learned this. You see, when it first started, I, I could tell faintly that it was a dream. They all had this haziness effect on my comprehension, but when I would microsleep, the dreams were incredibly vivid. He learned, Dr. A. He, he learned that I'm more afraid of the microsleep dreams and somehow made every dream just as clear since. I uh, honestly didn't know what to say. Either Andrew was completely and utterly crazy, or so intelligent that he was incubating his own insanity. I asked the only question I had left. When did you first dream of Ublu? It was right after my father died, he said, shifting his gaze back to the floor. He uh, killed himself, put a bullet in his head when I was 17. The night after the funeral, I was standing over his grave, looking down at the grass. It was normal for a bit, but then I heard him. I heard him screaming from in the ground, screaming for help, asking me to dig him out. But I couldn't move. I was frozen. I stood there and listened him banging on his coffin lid so hard that the ground was pulsing. And I heard him screaming in fear, but I couldn't, I just couldn't move. And then I heard it. Ublu. And then I woke up. I sat there staring at him for a long time. While his dismissal of lucid dreaming being a possibility is impressive, it's not uncommon for children to link a traumatic event to something imaginary to better comprehend what's happening. I was starting to gain some traction back. Um, when was the first time you saw Ublu? He hesitated for about half a second, but then he began talking. Uh, one time I dreamt of my dog, Buster. I was standing behind this great big fence and and I was just a kid so I couldn't climb it. Buster was on the other side of a busy freeway just sitting there looking at me and I knew somehow I, I just knew he was going to try to cross to come and see me and I knew he wouldn't make it. He ran to the freeway and got hit by a car instantly. I screamed and cried out, but the car didn't stop, it just kept going. Buster was laying there broken and bleeding. I saw him try to get up and he tried to crawl forward and another car came speeding by and hit him again. It kept happening. I kept watching him get hit and torn to shreds by these cars, but they just never stopped. That was the first time I saw him. I heard him right in my ear. Ublu. And then I turned and saw his face was an inch from mine, his huge black eyes staring right at me. And then I, uh, then I woke up. He was shaking now, and I could tell that he was close to breaking down. I had to stop pushing him. All right, Andrew, I, I think this is a good place to stop today. I stood up and walked over to my desk and got a prescription pad. Andrew sat there and blinked at me. You're gonna 
Are you gonna give me something to stop it? For now, I'm going to give you something to suppress your dreaming. Until I can diagnose where these dreams have been coming from, it's important that you get a good night of sleep. Help clear your thoughts. I'm helping you to help me help you. <laughs> get it? He blinked again. Uh, yes, I get it. Thank you. They have drugs to suppress dreaming? Well, technically no. There's a new drug called cyproheptidine that is used in treatment of a high fever. But one of the side effects is suppression of dreaming, nightmares specifically, uh, especially those induced by post-traumatic stress disorder. I kept writing the prescription in silence, and I could feel Andrew's eyes on me. But it's not from PTSD. It's, it's from Ublu. I, I know that, Andrew. I lied to him for the final time. But it'll work just as well as keeping Ublu out of your dreams as well. This got to him. He was overjoyed and sprung up from the couch. He kept thanking me and telling me that I was the best doctor he'd ever seen, that he finally felt like he had a fighting chance. I couldn't help but s smile at this. I guess it's the reason I had stuck with the practice after so long. I walked him to the door and shook his hand. He looked at me straight in the eyes, smiling for the first time since I'd met him and left my office. That was the last time I would see Andrew Jennings alive. A week went by, and the next Monday, Andrew didn't come in. Now, normally I'd breathe a sigh of relief, tell my secretary I was heading out to grab a cup of coffee down the street, but um, I couldn't help to wonder about Andrew. I thought about these dreams he'd been having ever since he left, and truth be told, I was almost looking forward to getting an update from him. I left the office and told my secretary I was heading down to uh, cancel my next appointment. In my hand, I had the bill for Andrew Jennings for our last session, which had his dress on it. He was staying in an apartment building his mother owned just outside of town. It was about a 15 minute drive away from my office. I managed to slip in through the front door just as someone was leaving and found his name on the directory. His name was just written down on paper, so I could tell he hasn't been here long. In fact, his mother probably just set him up here just so he could be closer to my office to uh, ease his commute. He was the last unit on the first floor. I made the long, arduous walk down the hall until I finally stopped at his door. I paused for a second and thought about what I was doing. My curiosity got the better of me and I knocked loudly three times. No answer. No sound of movement inside. After I'd listened for a good while, I knocked again, louder. Uh, Andrew, this is Dr. A. Could you come to the door, please? Still nothing. I tried the doorknob and surprisingly, it twisted all the way. I felt the weight of the door lift and I could tell it was open. I can't tell you how long I stood there, hand on the doorknob, just thinking. Thinking about how this would look. Doctor allows himself entry into a patient's apartment. Doctor potentially found a patient loaded on heroin, or potentially overdosed. Overdosed on heroin, but possibly the new drug he prescribed him. A known user, just a week ago. But what was worse was thinking about those horrible dreams he had told me of, as just a piece of wood separated himself and I. I took a breath and opened the door. The first thing I noticed was that the shades were drawn. There was no light save for a low wattage lamp in the corner. The air was stale and musky and laid out on the table were needles and spoons and empty bags. I walked through the living room and saw no signs of Andrew. There was a hallway just off the wall that the couch was against. I took out my phone and turned the flashlight on. I walked down the hall slowly, my breath short and my hands shaking. There was a door immediately to my left that was a gate. Carefully, I peered around the corner and shined my flashlight inside. It was the bathroom. Moderately dirty, but not the worst I'd seen. There were no signs of struggle. No vomit in the toilet. Nothing that would indicate a potential overdose. I left out a minor sigh of relief. 
and turned back into the hall. There was only one door left, straight ahead. It was shut completely, all white with a silver knob. I stood over the dark with my flashlight and looked for a light switch. These apartments were old. The switch must be in Andrew's room, behind this door. Realizing it wasn't getting any easier and swallowing my nerves, I began to creep towards the door. Every step felt like a mile. I f my feet felt clumsy and my legs heavy. By the time I reached the door, it felt like an hour passed. I sat there and just stared into the white, bare door, raised my hand and lightly wrapped my knuckles against the wood. Andrew, I asked as I knocked, the door creaking and gently swaying inward. Through the crack, I could make the faint outline of a person and push the door fully open. Andrew was on the ground, propped up sitting in the corner, his skin pale and white, his bright green eyes staring wide at the door I just came through. I stood there and stared at him in complete shock. It was the first time I'd ever seen a dead body outside of a casket. It just looked so void and lifeless. I noticed blood on the carpet and that his fingernails were split and bleeding, pried back from his finger in some places. I somehow managed to find the light switch and flick it on, and that's when I saw it. The end is the beginning, is what was carved in the wood deeply right next to him. I just stared at it long enough to see what it said, and then the smell hit me. The most foul thing I'd ever smelled, and in that moment, it all set in, and I felt more nauseous than I ever have in my life. I stood there bent over vomiting when an elderly woman from a few doors down opened her door and gasped when she saw me. Call 911, I yelled to her, vomiting again. I heard her door slam shut and I tried to make my way down the hallway to the lobby, stopping every 20 or so feet to gag. When the emergency responders came, they pronounced him dead at the scene. They must have been used to this sort of thing because they didn't seem too faced by it. I gave a statement to the police and I told them that he was a patient of mine and that I was checking in. They didn't seem too suspicious and told me that if they needed anything that they would call. I left my business card with them and I walked back to my car. As I started to pull out, a car came screeching into the parking lot and I saw a woman get out. It was Mrs. Jennings. She was bawling and screaming and a, a few officers ran to her to restrain her. That's my baby! No, please God, no! She yelled as she tried to fight through the policeman. I watched as much as I could bear and drove out of the parking lot. I called my secretary and told her to cancel all my meetings for that day. Stopped at the liquor store to pick up a bottle of whiskey and drove myself home. I stood there and drank in silence for a long time. Eventually, I turned the ball game on and ordered some food, but when it came I couldn't even bring myself to eat. By the time I had finished the bottle, it was getting late. I stood up and stumbled down the hall to my bedroom, kicked off my shoes and fell face first into my mattress. I laid there thinking about Andrew, about his pale lifeless body propped up in the corner staring at me with those big green eyes, about his last message, the end is the beginning, echoing through my brain trying to find a rhyme or reason to it. My thoughts were growing slower and my eyelids growing heavy. The end is the beginning, playing over and over in my head. I felt myself just listing off to sleep when I heard it. From nowhere and everywhere, all at once. Oh, blow.